Hey, good evening, CNBC family, and welcome to another Wednesday night recharge. I'm Pastor Gary M. Renfro, pastor of the Corinth Missionary Baptist Church here in Austin, Texas, and we're grateful to God to be with you once again. Thank God that you're here with us, that God has blessed us to see a brand new day. And here we are this evening uh, with another time in the Word, especially this book study that we've been looking at, uh, Finding Your Calling. So again, glad that you have joined us. And as we always do every Wednesday, we want to catch you up on some things that are happening at the Corinth Church, and then also spend some time together in prayer over our sick and our shut-in, and then we get into the Word of God. And so uh, to start with, I want to say thank you to uh, the men of our church. Last Sunday, we had our Men's Day annual service. It was an awesome service, a blessed word coming from uh, Pastor Roy Jones, pastor of the New Hope Church here in Austin. He did a phenomenal job on Sunday talking to us about going the distance in the rain, standing in faith and standing in the favor of God and then standing to finish. So thank you, Pastor Roy Jones, for that awesome word. And then I want to say thank you uh, to the men who give leadership uh, to our men and boys ministry. Number one, Minister James Ockleberry for everything that he continues to do. We've had a great month in the month of June of celebrating men, of men activities together. And so thank you, uh, my brother. And then uh, Minister Ray Ephraim uh, for his work with uh, Boys to Men for Christ. And Thank him for always being there and leading our young men and gathering other men to work with them. And so again, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for such an awesome time that we had on Sunday. Now, by way of announcements, um, <clears throat> want to let you know that this coming Sunday, we want to acknowledge our graduates. It is our Graduates Appreciation Day and we want to celebrate them. Uh, this year, we've taken it up a notch and so we're not only celebrating our high school students who are graduating from high school and going on to uh, better things and bigger things, college and, and trade and all of that kind of stuff. We also want to acknowledge all of our students. And so this is where we are going to say, hey, congratulations to those who are moving up to the next level. So from pre-K to kindergarten, from kindergarten to the first grade, elementary to middle, and from middle to high school. So we're going to acknowledge everybody on Sunday. So we invite you to come. Let's be a part of that worship service. Let's celebrate our young people. Let's celebrate our young people. That's what we like to do at Corinth, and so we want to do that this coming Sunday. That service starts at 1030, so that's a 1030 worship service. Uh, thank God for our team uh, that has been putting this together and working together, and so I think um, they're contacting our parents to, to let them know when the, to have the kids there and ready to march in and all that good stuff. But that's for our 1030 a.m. worship this coming Sunday, Graduates Appreciation Day. Secondly, Vacation Bible School is coming up. Vacation Bible School will be from July 8th through July 12th this year uh, from 6.15 to 8.15 each evening. And so Sister Ockerberry and her team uh, are working uh, to prepare an awesome time for our young people. It's always been a blessing uh, for us at Corinth to have a wonderful vacation Bible school. And so we look forward to that this year. We had to move it back a little bit as we continue to do uh, uh, construction remodel work there at the church. And so our plan is to be ready to host and have VBS uh, July the 8th through the 12th. And then lastly, another youth activity. I think um, July is going to probably turn out to be the youth month this, uh, this year. Uh, so our youth annual service will be on July the 14th. So uh, culminating the week of Vacation Bible School, we have the week-long activities there. And then that, that coming Sunday, right after that 1030 worship service is where we want to honor uh, our young people in, in service and just, just have a good time in worship and, and having them lead us in worship on that Sunday. And so those are the activities, those are the announcements that we have uh, coming up in a few weeks. Um, there's some more that we're going to share with our young people, but I think right now these main uh, ones uh, are, are the ones that we want to share with you on tonight. So please, ma'am, please, sir, let's govern yourselves accordingly to uh, those announcements. And then always our announcements come out uh, from the church on constant contact. All right, y'all, before we get into our time of, of study together, uh, we always want to bow for a moment and just lift up our prayer concerns 
uh, unto the God, the, the, the maker, the creator uh, of heaven and earth. Our Father uh, is, is wanting us to, is, is willing for us to come before him, to share with him all that is on our hearts, all the things that are concerning us. And God already knows. Now, let's, let's be sure about that fact. There's nothing hidden from him. He already knows, but he, he gets pleasure in us drawing near to him and growing in our relationship with him, spending time with him, seeking him. And so we want to do that tonight, especially for those that are part of our families, um, our friendships, co-workers, uh, our neighbors, um, those that may be just going through a tough time. And, and so we want to lay it all at the, the, the altar uh, of our God uh, for them, for those that are dealing with sickness and, and illness, um, whatever that may be, physically, we want to put that before the altar. Those that are having a tough time emotionally, some that are dealing with grief and sorrow and loneliness and a feeling of hopelessness, all of that. God says, give it, give it, give it here. Place it on my shoulders. And so that's what we want to do tonight for every care and concern affecting our church family. Let's go to God in prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. If you join and agree with me in this prayer, I believe that our God moves when we come together and partner in prayer. So why don't we do that now? Father, we say thank you once again for this time that we have this blessed privilege that we have, God, to come before you, to be alive, to, to, to have our health, to have our strength, breath moving in and out of our lungs, God, to be in our right mind. God, we don't want to take those things for granted. We want to say tonight, thank you. Thank you for our rising up this morning. Thank you for protecting us as we went about our day's activity. Thank you for providing for us, God, so that we didn't have to go without master. Thank you, God, being who you are and already understanding and knowing that as a good, good father, you know exactly what we stand in need of and that, God, you have provided and you will continue to provide. But, God, we come before you in this, this way, this moment, this time now, because, God, there are those that are connected to us, those that who are a part of our church family, Father, that are going through. Some are sick, some are hurting, uh, some have, have relationships that, that, are, that are, uh, uh, are in trouble and, and, and strained, and some, God, that are dealing with emotional uh, concerns, that got their minds running daily, and even at night can't really lay down and rest because their mind continues to run and thoughts and all of that, Father. You said that we can put that before you. You said cast all of our cares our anxieties, our worries, our troubles. Father, we place them at your feet. Would you please, Lord God, have your way. Father God, do a work on us before you do a work in it, whatever our it is. And help us, Father God, to, to get into your word. And we pray, Lord God, that you would send a word to that thing that is disturbing us and hurting us and causing concern uh, and anxiousness. Send your word, O oh God. But we want to be found resting in you, trusting in you. So I lift up, God, this your church family, the Corinth family, and all of our connections, all of our friends who are watching this, this YouTube video and who continue to watch and be a part of our online uh, fellowship and gathering together. God bless these, your people. Bless real good. May we stand in your favor as Pastor Jones preached on this past Sunday. Stand in faith. Stand in your favor. And then, Lord God, you help us stand until it is finished. This, Father God, we pray and ask. And as you go with us now into this time of study, guide our thoughts and our minds in your Son, Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, y'all, let's get, uh, get into our Bible study together. I trust that you are getting your notes for Bible study. Reach out to us at cnbcaustin.org. That way we can uh, get you the notes that we provide each and every time we come together on Wednesday. 
And this Wednesday, we continue in our book, Finding Your Calling, The Stories We Live. Kathleen A. Cahollin is our author. And tonight we are in chapter eight. We're in chapter eight. I trust that you have been blessed as we've been spending uh, this time in this book. It, it is an outgrowth of a message that we have preached a few Sundays back in regards to our giftedness and growing in our gifts and, and allowing God to use what he has given us. We know that he has gifted the church with certain individuals with certain gifts, but all of us have a gifting and all of us, according to our, our author, we all have a calling a calling and that we are called in different ways and not just in one particular way or just not in the one way in which we are gifted but in a lot of different areas we have been called and God is using us in all of those various areas of our lives and so this book is trying to help us see those see those from the standpoint of uh, a preposition that we have been called in We've been called through, we have been called by, we have been called as. So we have been called in various ways. And tonight we're looking at how we have been called by the God within. Called by the God within. That's chapter eight in our, in our book. We begin with Luke 17, 21. The kingdom of God is within you. I want to read that and I want to back up to verse 20. Uh, and this is coming from uh, the new revised standard version of this passage. It says, once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is among you. So in this particular uh, text, Jesus makes it clear that the kingdom is unlike any kingdom uh, with which the Pharisees were familiar. So they're asking him about the kingdom. They're familiar with the kingdom of God, but, but this is different. What Jesus is talking about is different. It's coming cannot be observed. It is in the midst of you, is what he's saying. And it's an expression for which a number of meanings have been suggested. He's saying the kingdom of God is within you. So you are looking for, and many because they couldn't accept how Jesus came and the, and the way Jesus came, they couldn't accept it because they don't see kingdoms established like that. They see kingdoms established by warriors and, and, and fighting and, and struggle, and then out of that comes a victor. And so this is not how Jesus says the kingdom comes. You won't be able to observe it, he says, because the kind of kingdom I'm talking about is a kingdom that starts within. And so there are different ways that you can look at this particular uh, text. Number one, the kingdom is essentially inward. So that, that's, that's self-explanatory, that's in the text itself. So it is within us, it's in our hearts. But then B says the words prophesy the way the kingdom will come, that it will suddenly appear. So not only is he saying you can't observe it, you won't see it coming, it will just be there. It will, it will come upon us. So that's one of the ways that this text is talking about God within. He said, it will just come suddenly. See, the kingdom is within your reach, is within your grasp. It is attainable if you go about it the right way. So you don't have to have a certain uh, theological degree or you don't have to be a part of a particular denomination or belong or have a family heritage of preachers and bishops and all of that. He says, no, it is attainable to all of us. It's within our reach. But you just got to know how to go about doing it, how to go about attaining it. And then D, it says, the kingdom is among you. Again, that means it is present in the person and ministry of Jesus. And this seems to be the way that Jesus is wanting us to take it when he says, to them, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, interchangeably, is within you. And so we're able to see this in the person 
<clears throat> and ministry of Jesus. So now our author says that the preposition within, like in the text, points to two great mysteries of the Christian faith. So she uses two of these that we're lifting up here. A, that the kingdom is inward. D, that it also helps us to understand the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. God comes to dwell within our midst, abiding within us, and God calls each of us to abide within the Holy Spirit the one holy mystery. Again, Jesus Christ, his, his work, his, his, his purpose. And so sometimes the call within is difficult to hear because of the distractions of life. So she says sometimes it's, it's tough for us to make out uh, God calling us because of all the other voices that are going on that you need to be over here and you need to be doing this and you need to get this accomplishment done and, and you need to, 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 to make this person happy and you don't want to upset those folks. So all of these voices and then what uh, the media is telling us and how we're to live and, and how we're to be, all of these voices, but yet it could be tough for us to hear the call of God that comes from within because they're being drowned out. God's dwelling place there's a story told throughout the Bible. After Israel is delivered from Egypt, they set out for the place that he had promised, the promised land, a place where he would choose, he says, to set his name. So when they came into the promised land, the Mount of Jerusalem and the temple became his dwelling place. So even as they have been delivered out of Egypt, that as they're making their way through the wilderness, God is saying, but I'm dwelling, my presence um, is with you. That they, they saw his presence in the smoke as it moved by day. They saw his presence in the flame of fire as they moved by night. And so his presence has always been with them so that when they finally get to this land, that he's promised and they, they build this beautiful city, Jerusalem and the temple. He says, now this will be my dwelling place. Now understand that God cannot be contained in a particular location. That comes out of first Kings when Solomon has built the, uh, the temple for God. He's made all that, that was necessary and then he is consecrating the house for uh, God. He says here in chapter 8, verses 27, but God will indeed dwell on the earth. Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. So we understand that God cannot be contained in a house. When, when they said his presence was in the ark, God is not in a box. It is just symbolizing his presence being with us. But once the land, Israel's land, once Jerusalem was gone and once the temple where God would meet with them on a daily basis and the Holy of Holies, once that was all gone, lost, the temple destroyed because of their disobedience, they were forced into exile and carried to places where they questioned if God had forsaken them. The prophet Ezekiel reminds them that God was with them wherever they were, even in exile. He says, my dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God had not forsaken them. God had not left them. Neither uh, will he leave us or forsake us. He's with us. In the story of Jesus, he's declared to be the dwelling place of God. Matthew 1 and 23, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So now in the person of Jesus Christ, he's saying, God, I'm, I'm here and I'm dwelling among you. I dwell with you because he's Christ. He's Jesus. He's come to be with us. The psalmist says it, Psalm 90 and one, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. So we're to find that, that God is our dwelling place and he is among us and he is within us. All right. So how can we experience the God who dwells within? 
Well, you experience him, one, through silence. Through silence. God's first language, according to St. John of the Cross, who was a 16th century mystic, his first language is silence, a language that is beyond human words. Now, how many of us are honest in saying that silence can be an issue for many of us? Nothing said, that's an issue. But in our silence, God is present and we can come to know him beyond any knowledge or words about him. Just sitting quietly in his presence. Now, when, when I share, I, uh, at least when I spend my quiet time in the mornings and, or when I can uh, outside of the mornings, it's trying to, one, first spend it in quiet. Now, I can hear maybe the birds outside in the trees, and sometimes I can hear the traffic driving along the highways, but I'm trying to calm my mind, my thoughts, and just be quiet with him. That's his first language, silence, silence. And so we discover him uh, in that silence. In our silence, God is present, present and we can come to know him beyond any knowledge or words about him. Kahalan says that learning to know God in silence is known as contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer where words have to be abandoned. In other words, here it is, up here. Nothing coming from our mouths, but everything here. Contemplating on God, thinking about God. And it takes effort. It takes effort to seek out God, to, to silence your mind and wait. So it's not an easy task. It will take some work, but you can do it. I know in sharing in one of my classes last semester and looking at various world religions, it just interested me how Buddhists could sit and just meditate. And I mean, they could sit for hours, quiet, just in meditation. But it's a practice that you have to train yourself to do. They didn't just start out doing that. You have to train yourself to be in silence. Silence your mind and wait. And you may find out that what you discover with silence is that it has the capacity to unmask what is false inside and peel away the la layers of self-absorption and then it helps us to remake ourselves into the image of Christ. In other words, when we sit and be quiet, and we begin to just train our mind and our attention on him, it begins to reveal some things about us, it begins to peel back the layers of our onion and help us to really take a good look at us. And when we do that, then we start to say, okay, God, fix me, work on me so that it begins to shape me and mold me into the image of, of Christ. All of this through contemplative prayer because it helps to purify our intention. So before we even go to God, before we even open a word uh, to, to him, it ought to be spending time in quiet. Because in that quiet time, we might discover that the thing I was going to ask and the thing I was going to mention to God and bring to his attention might be the very thing that God is saying, no, that's a you deal. That's a you issue. And so it causes me to look at myself and that, that probably then in turn changes my prayer. It changes our prayer because we're quiet, silent. So that's one of the languages that God can then call us from within if we're willing to spend the time and learn how to be with him in silence. Again, it is not easy, it is, it is some work, but I think it's, it's necessary. Outside of silence, the other language God uses to call us from within are his word. He is waiting to engage us when we spend time in his word, reading and listening to the words of scripture. We should let the words speak to us. It is alive and living among us and within us. God's word. Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's that word again, intentions. So not only is it happening in our silence, but it's also happening in the word of God, the power of the word of God. Cuts away at all the fluff and the fat and gets right down to it. The, na the, the, the marrow, the bone, it gets right down to the issue. It pierces right to the issue. But he begins by saying, for the word of God is living and active. His word is living and active. His word works. So because of the potent power of the word, we should incorporate it into our daily lives. And so how did the early Christians do that? They did it by memorizing scripture. That's how they put the the, the word of God into daily practice was by one daily reading and then committing those scripture verses to memory. And it says that uh, the Psalms were a favorite text in trying to memorize. Now, when we were younger, we were taught uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk, making me to lie down in green pastures. He leads beside still waters. He restores my soul, leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You, you learn that growing up. We had to learn and memorize that. But it doesn't just stop at Psalm 23. Psalm 1. Psalm uh, uh, 27 and 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So all of these scriptures you commit to memory. And the more you commit to memory and think about, the more those scriptures then begin to start talking to you. And uh, the, the author said, the more you read those scriptures, the more those scriptures begin to read you and begin to cause you to change some things and change some attitudes and, and actions. Uh, the words of scripture become a part of our daily routine and we respond to them. Especially when the Holy Spirit says, ah, you've been looking at that word. You've been studying that word. Now that word applies to this situation right here. So don't say that thing because of the word you've been, don't do that thing because of the word you've been looking at, you've been studying. See how, how the word becomes alive and active. The words of scripture are not just a record of what happened back in the day, but they are relevant for us today. They are real and relevant for us today. They read us in the now, our present life, and, and cause us to make changes in our behavior. So when you hear me talk about, um, or in my prayer before I preach, for the Holy Spirit to stand in my body and to think with my mind and to speak with my mouth, so that God, by your word, not my opinion, not my thought processes, but by your word. I'm taking God's word and I'm trying to contextualize his word to make it uh, uh, plain so that we can see how it fits in our lives today. So by your word, God, I, I, I would like for you, I'm, I'm asking you to confront that which is within me that doesn't please you. That's what I pray. God, by your word, convict me. Now that I'm confronted and I, I see that thing in front of me and you've made, it, made me aware of it. Your spirit makes me aware of it. God, then let my heart be convicted so that then I can turn away from that thing. If I'm not convicted of what I am doing, then there is no change. But once you confront me with it, then Father God, convict me. Cause me to repent of that thing. I'm asking you, God, by your word to challenge me so that it helps me to grow and, and so that we can be better. So give us a word, God, that will challenge us. But most of all, and this is how I end the prayer, most of all, give us your word, God, so that it will change. And that's the bottom line, God, that, that, that his word calling us from within brings about a change because that's the only thing that will. It's the only thing that really brings true and honest change is the word of God. So by prayer, the moving of his spirit, taking the word and creating and causing a transformation. That's it. And so God is calling us from within in silence, calling us through his word 
so that then we can answer what God has put within us. Answer by and through what God has put within us. Remember, we all have been called from within. If we're a believer, all of us have been called from within. Let's bow. Father, again, we say thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord God, that your word does a work on us because it is alive. It's living. It is active. And so, God, we say uh, have your way. We pray that we get into it, that we learn more, we read more so that, Father God, you can use your word to bring about a kingdom difference, a kingdom difference in us and then a kingdom difference around us. I pray, Father God, that you would keep these your people, uh, protect them, especially, Lord, as we lay down tonight and rest. And then, God, should you say so, and you spare our lives to see a brand new day, help us to be reminded that we say to you, thank you. We love you, we bless you, we honor you in the precious and awesome name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless.